Good afternoon, all. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Walter T. Richardson. I currently chair, for the next few minutes, I chair the uh, Community Relations Board from Miami-Dade County. It's been my pleasure to serve in that capacity for the last uh, three and a half, three and three and uh, seven eighths years. Uh, so thank you for being here. On behalf of the Miami-Dade Community Relations Board, uh, welcome this, to this forum on protecting communities of faith in our community. Uh, thank you for joining us in this dialogue as we discuss this very timely and critical issue. Thank you for demonstrating your commitment to our shared values of equality and equal protection for all. Thank you to the members of the Miami-Dade County Asian American, Asian American Advisory Board. Uh, we have with us the chair of that board, Mr. Victor uh, Swaru. Um, we're honored to have him with us today, join us on the dais. And to our partners at the United States Department of Justice Community Relations Service, uh, Ms. Mildred Robles is here to help us with this conversation. As you all probably know, the Community Relations Board works to foster mutual understanding, tolerance, and respect among all economic, social, religious, and ethnic groups here in Miami-Dade County. The CRB members are prominent county residents, many of them are seated with us on the dais, who serve as advisors to the mayor, the board of county commissioners, and the community at large on issues impacted intergroup relations. We are business, civic, government, and religious leaders who believe that no one should be singled out for hatred, prejudice, or blame based on his or her ethnic origin, nationality, or religion. And so we are, as a board, very concerned about recent reports about acts of intimidation, vandalism, and of hate crimes and hate speech in our own South Florida community. Fortunately, these events do not occur often, and most of our peoples strive to cooperate, co cooperate with and respect each other as we seek a better quality of life for us all. So again, we are thankful that you have joined us for this wonderful conversation. Uh, with uh, the United States Department of Homeland Security. We appreciate this opportunity to engage with one of our country's finest uh, conversationalists and experts in this area, uh, Mr. Kareem Shora, who happens to be the Senior Policy Advisor in Chief of Community Engagement for the Office of Civil Rights and Civil Liberties at the United States Department of Homeland Security. He'll be more formally introduced in just a few minutes. In 2010, <clears throat> the CRB convened a summit on hate crimes hate speech and media responsibility that brought together several hundred community leaders and agency representatives. An action plan was created that the CRB continues to work to implement. As you are probably aware, the CRB also convened the I Am My Brother's Keepers response team, this team of community leaders representing diverse faith traditions that will respond quickly and effectively to acts of violence, vandalism, or aggression that victimize faith-based institutions individuals or groups in Miami-Dade County. As you are probably also aware, recently the CRB brought together community leaders and members together with law enforcement to discuss ways to reduce tensions resulting from recent incidents at the Islamic School of Miami. The leaders update on community responses was convened at the Islamic School of Miami and we're very happy to have with us today the Deputy Director for Miami-Dade Police Department uh, Juan Perez, who's joining us today, and may at some point have something he'd like to interject to facilitate this conversation. So the conversation today is intended to continue the effort to build stronger relationships among our diverse communities. And again, thank you for working with us to do to that end. Um, our good friend, uh, Mildred de Robles, is here with us. And uh, she has the privilege today of uh, introducing our very special guest, who has traveled here from cold country to warm country. If I was in this position, I'd be traveling from cold country to warm country as well. So please join me in welcoming Mildred uh, de Robles, who will introduce our speaker. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Mildred Dupre de Robles, and I'm a conciliation specialist with the United States Department of Justice Community Relations Service. In a book titled A Passion for Justice by Robert Solomon, there is a statement that reads, Justice is, first of all, a matter of individual virtues and feelings, but both justice and the individuals are defined within community. And justice ultimately has to be the concern of the community. It emphasizes that 
The general utility does not mean that impersonal sum of the well-being of an individual citizen. The Department of Justice Community Relations Service in summary is Title 10 of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And our role and interest is to seek the cooperation and explore opportunities to open lines of communications when groups, communities, and individuals therein respond to real or perceived civil rights violations on the basis of race, color, national origin. And in support of the Hate Crimes Prevention Act of 2009, CRS is also listed as a result in the prevention and response to acts that if left unattended can lead into hate crimes, whether real or perceived on the basis of sexual orientation, gender, gender identity, disability, race, color, national origin, and religion. We, through our services of consultation, training, facilitated dialogue and mediation, work also interagency and interdepartmental collaborating uh, in responses when communities or groups, again, um, are drafting or developing conflict resolutions to those elements that appear to threaten or perceive to threat the peace in that community. Through the CRS assessment, as mentioned by Dr. Richardson, um, the community identified the opportunity to extend, again, the invitation to the um, guest speaker today, Kareem Shora, as representative of the Department of Homeland Security, Civil Rights, Civil Liberties. For in his office, he offers additional assistance um, that was again identified as a resource in response to initially the facilitated dialogue that was uh, conducted in West Kendall. At this time, I just want to uh, mention that um, Kareem has been appointed to his position, I believe in 209, is that correct? Yes. And he is a native of Damascus, Syria. Um, he was, uh, before coming to the Department of Homeland Security, uh, very active also in his role as legal advisor, legal director, and national executive director uh, with the American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee, among many other roles that he helped. Uh, so he also has a lot of experience, again, that, uh, in service in the community. At this time, without further ado. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mildred and Dr. Richardson, for those uh, kind uh, points of introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I want to thank the uh, Miami-Dade County uh, Community Relations Board for uh, including me in this uh, today's program, and of course, uh, my colleagues at the U.S. Department of Justice uh, Community Relations Service, who are, um, at least on the federal side, our friends on the ground uh, who are here full time and uh, here to support uh, all local efforts to uh, keep our country uh, safe and secure. Um, uh, as everybody knows, uh, I'm sure, the Department of Homeland Security has a, a very vital mission. Um, uh, our primary aim is to work with our state and local partners and with society generally to make sure that we uh, very effectively uh, address all forms of threats we face, whether man-made or, uh, or natural. And uh, this requires the dedication of over 230,000 uh, employees, uh, including law enforcement and, and other positions, uh, from aviation and border security to emergency responses, from cybersecurity to uh, chemical facility inspectors. While our duties are wide-ranging, uh, our goal is unified and clear, which is keeping our country safe. Um, over the past few weeks, my office, which is part of the uh, office of the Secretary at uh, DHS headquarters in Washington, D.C., has heard from many of you at the local level, both here in Florida and elsewhere, um, expressing concern and asking for resources on uh, various points of contact that we can help facilitate to mitigate uh, acts of violence uh, directed at certain communities. Many have expressed concerns of targeted acts of violence that are directed at certain communities who have expressed uh, themselves as being uh, feeling vulnerable 
uh, in the current uh, situation that we're facing as a nation. And so part of my conversation here today, part of my presence is to see, number one, hear from you, uh, to see how the U.S. Department of Homeland Security can leverage the resources we do offer, working with our state and local partners to make sure that we mitigate those forms of threats. And number two, uh, to share what we can do at the federal level to try to promote a more cohesive effort to protect our homeland from the various threats we face uh, as a country. Um, so part of the mission of DHS uh, when it was first created was to ensure that civil rights and civil liberties of persons are not diminished by efforts, activities, and programs aid, aimed at securing our, our homeland. It's in fact part of the uh, Homeland Security Act uh, that uh, the department's primary mission uh, going beyond just generally securing the nation is preserving uh, the liberty, the fairness, and the equality under law that we're trying to protect as we move forward to physically protect uh, our society. I spearhead, and thanks to Mildred's introduction, I spearhead something called the Community Engagement Section at DHS headquarters. Our primary function is to really coordinate with the various DHS agencies on the ground, uh, some of which may be represented here today in their own specific areas of responsibility, uh, coordinate with our federal colleagues, such as the U.S. Department of Justice, uh, Community Relations Service, Civil Rights Division, the United States Attorney's Office locally, um, as well as the uh, Federal Bureau of Investigations, the FBI, uh, to make sure we respond to community concerns, to provide reliable information, to be able to get past any filters and have an honest dialogue and a conversation, establishing a two-way highway line of communication from the local level, first responders, community leaders, uh, to the federal level, both at the policy side as well as at the enforcement and, and compliance side. Um, so how do we do this? Uh, Mildred mentioned that I, I frequently basically parachute down from, from Washington DC down to Florida to have, have, the, have these types of conversations. Uh, we've structured a number of projects and programs, uh, primarily anchored with the, what you see on the map here, and this is slightly outdated, I apologize. We, we have a couple more cities to add here. Uh, to convene interagency federal, state, and local roundtables, community engagement roundtables around the country. We're currently in 16 major metropolitan areas around the country, and the idea is to have an ongoing dialogue about these types of conversations. Uh, we don't want to be caught in a position where we're being uh, retroactively responsive to incidents. Uh, while we're well prepared to do that, working with our state and local partners, our primary aim is to be as proactive as possible in sharing as much information as possible and obtaining as much information as possible so that we can uh, make sure we execute our mission effectively. Uh, and so as you see on the map, uh, our current standing roundtable uh, in the state of Florida right now is in the Tampa-Orlando corridor. We sort of uh, go around between this, the two major metro areas. But um, I think uh, with Mildred's effort, and, and I know the US Department of Justice here spearheading this work, uh, we will try our best to make sure we're as responsive as possible to serve the uh, Miami-Dade uh, area whenever, whenever is appropriate and requested by our, our local partners. Um, what do these roundtables establish? Why do we have them? Uh, this is not a new concept. Uh, we've had these roundtables since really the initial standing up of the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. Um, uh, the idea was to really engage with uh, local communities so that we are able to build a better cohesive, more robust societal approach that's community driven to the concept of homeland security. Um, as I said uh, earlier, DHS is tasked with quite a number of uh, responsibilities working with our local component agencies on the ground. A lot of it is a law enforcement function. Uh, a lot of it is a coordination function with law enforcement. Uh, perhaps some funding comes into play with the Federal Emergency Management Agency and, and, and USCIS, US Citizenship and Immigration Services and others. But much of it is to simply make sure that everybody's on the same page, both with understanding what the threats look like that we face. Uh, we, we, we live in a very uh, challenging environment. I don't have to tell you that. We know that. We've seen the types of incidents that we're facing uh, nationally, internationally, 
the threat is very real. And our aim in making sure that civil rights and civil liberties are protected, are respected, and in fact are guaranteed, goes to the very bottom of what the mission of DHS is, which is keeping our nation secure. Uh, if you speak to any of one of my colleagues in uniform at the state and local level, they will assure you that making sure everyone at the local level and local communities is aware, is on the lookout for acts of violence, uh, is the best approach. It's the idea of community policing. Uh, local law enforcement has championed community policing as an ideal model to keeping communities safe both in very large metropolitan areas as well as at the very local level. So we're not coming up with anything new at DHS. What we're trying to do is basically implement the community policing model at the national level, making sure that we're sharing information as much as possible, making sure that communities on the ground are as transparent with us as we are able to be transparent with them. And so these roundtables that I referenced that we have quarterly that are very interagency are designed to continue that conversation while our partners on the ground are actually addressing the immediate real life incidents that uh, we're all tackling as a society. So what are the challenges? And I'm not going to go through a list of them because I think everybody knows what the challenges are. It's not easy to have some of these conversations. Uh, but it is absolutely necessary to have these conversa conversations. Um, sometimes we have conversations about basic integration of new communities in our country and how we're able to support them in integrating into society. Sometimes we have conversations about even more challenging incidents, such as the ones that were referenced earlier in the introduction. Unfortunately, that took place apparently here in the uh, Miami-Dade area. And sometimes our aim is to make sure we simply explain what we're trying to do when we say, see something, say something. DHS is spearheading a national effort in this regard. Some of you may be aware of see something, say something. And the idea is to make sure everyone in society is fully aware of what signs to look out for that may be deemed suspicious, that may be a cause for a potential act of violence, regardless of what that act of violence is. Uh, as far as we're concerned, violence is violence. Uh, violating the law is violating the law. And our aim is to make sure that uh, we implement that understanding by engaging in these conversations uh, such as the ones we're having here uh, today. Are there grievances related to the federal government? Of course there are. Otherwise, I wouldn't have a job. Um, our aim is when people raise those grievances, and, and we have sort of a general list of what we tackle on a, on a regular basis, uh, and this is obviously by no means uh, exhaustive. Our aim is to try to be responsive. If there's a legitimate grievance that someone is raising related to a, a violation of civil rights and civil liberties, then our aim is to be as responsive as possible, to address that specific grievance. Uh, oftentimes, and you see the list here that I have on the screen, a lot of times these issues are mitigated and resolved simply by engaging in that kind of conversation to explain what the actual policy is and how, in fact, it is implemented on the ground. Uh, oftentimes people will have their questions answered simply by our ability to have that conversation with them on those specific sets of grievances. We do quite a number of subject-specific community events. So I have a colleague right now in the city of Los Angeles doing a very similar event today and another colleague in Atlanta just up the road doing a similar event. Those events are geared towards uh, local community driven concerns that have been raised where the Department of Homeland Security has certain equities or the Department of Homeland Security can come in and provide certain responses. So we do that quite a bit and, and uh, hopefully in support of local efforts such as the ones we're having here today our aim is to be able to ratchet up those efforts so that we uh, uh, maintain uh, our, these conversations. We do quite a bit of faith community engagement. Faith-based communities uh, often play a vital role in our country uh, at the interfaith level, uh, at the civil society level, in uh, really providing us both with the platforms as well as with the credibility to be able to have these types of conversations with individuals. Uh, uh, our
our nation is a, a very diverse mosaic, but we have a lot of communities from very diverse backgrounds, from very diverse faiths, and one thing we found that's a, an asset in society is the fact that there are a lot of interfaith efforts going on at the, at the local level in our country. And uh, those types of efforts uh, often lend themselves to what we're trying to do at DHS as far as establishing that two-way highway I spoke of earlier. Um, I've heard criticisms in, 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 in forums such as this and others where they say, well, you're just checking the box. You're just uh, you know, coming in and saying, well, I did this here in Miami-Dade and you send it in some report somewhere. Um, that's why we have regular dialogue. We're not just checking the box. The roundtables I referenced, some of them have been going on since uh, 2006, uh, 2005, 2006. Uh, four times a year uh, in those major metro areas and people keep coming back. Uh, so obviously we must be doing something right if people choose to come back and meet with uh, this suit who's flying in from Washington DC to, uh, to uh, have a conversation with them. Uh, so no, we're not just uh, marking the box. Uh, we do see a strength in our local diversity. Uh, I think it's very well evidenced in uh, the representation we see here today at the local level with the Community Relations Board and Miami-Dade. Uh, Miami uh, we feel that that diversity actually gives us an edge in our effort to uh, uh, protect our homeland and counter uh, all forms of violence that we tackle as a society and, and as a nation. And so oftentimes what we do when there are very specific policies where we feel that uh, diversity uh, can lend itself at the policy level is we actually invite community leaders, uh, both uh, interfaith and otherwise, at the local level to join us in policy uh, discussions in Washington, D.C., to hear directly so that we can have the uh, uh, folks who are much, much higher level than my pay grade uh, engage in the types of conversation that I do for a living at the local level. Um, uh, what do we offer to communities? Uh, and in the handout you have today, I understand that uh, my colleagues here did share uh, a communication that my office released earlier this, year, uh, earlier this week related to available resources. Uh, communities can capitalize on quite a number of resources at the federal level, both with the uh, Department of Homeland Security as well as with the Department of Justice. Uh, through uh, our protective security advisors where we provide uh, my colleagues at the uh, Office of Infrastru Infra uh, Infrastructure Protection uh, at the, in the Miami-Dade area can offer security assessments uh, to critical infrastructure and that does include faith-based communities, houses of worship, uh, faith-based schools, uh, and if uh, anyone's interested we do have the contact information. Uh, locally, and we can make sure we liaison with the appropriate protective security advisor for DHS here in the Miami-Dade area to, to schedule a conversation with them. Uh, my colleagues at the Federal Emergency Management Agency have quite a number of grants that are available, uh, external, that communities may choose to apply for uh, within the context of this conversation, and we have uh, information on that in the handout you have in front of you. Uh, we do offer active shooter training, as I know uh, a lot of the major local police departments do as well. Um, as well as our colleagues at the FBI. Uh, so uh, communities may choose to take advantage of that, unfortunately, especially given the uh, recent incidents we've seen uh, all over our country, whether in Colorado, California, or, uh, or uh, elsewhere. Um, the one thing we also offer is rapid communication. And this is something that we uh, uh, spearhead on behalf of DHS. Should there be an unfortunate incident of violence of national significance. Uh, what DHS can offer to communities at the local level in the incidents area, uh, geographically speaking, is within usually 24 to 48 hours of an incident while things are still developing. We basically get on the line with community leaders, uh, uh, both uh, law enforcement as well as federal, uh, interfaith, civil society, who we think may be impacted, who we think can either share information directly with us or whether we can share information with them about what's, what's going on. And this is the uh, rapid incident coordination goals that we do with something called the ICCT or the Incident Community Coordination uh, Team uh, effort, uh, most recently activated with the incidents that we, we uh, uh, unfortunately are all too familiar with uh, uh, recently uh, nationally. Um, Communities often ask, well, what do you actually do for a living when we do raise those grievances? 
uh, you know, you're telling me, uh, you know, I've got uh, problems with, uh, you know, at the airport. You know, I get screened and oftentimes I spend six hours being screened and I end up missing my flight. And I think it's because uh, of my faith or of my race or what have you. Uh, my office actually does have administrative investigative authority over all DHS agencies from the civil rights perspective. And so, as I said, if there are legitimate uh, case examples of legitimate grievances that individuals uh, want to raise, uh, we have that authority working with our component agencies and uh, we're able to look into uh, individual incidents of acts of discrimination alleged to have uh, uh, taken place uh, on, on the part of uh, DHS personnel. Uh, I'm not going to bore you with this flow chart, but oftentimes we, uh, you know, we do hear concerns of, well, you're not being transparent enough. So we actually demonstrate clearly what happens to a complaint when someone files it with our office uh, and demonstrate exactly how we get back to the individual and how we keep them looped in as the investigation is, uh, is taking its course. And I'm, I'm more than willing to uh, get into that if individuals, members of the audience, have questions on, uh, on that front. A lot of... Uh, our efforts are also focused on uh, raising awareness. Uh, as I said, we take pride in the diversity of our nation. Uh, we take pride in the diversity of our communities and, and society. We feel it's, in fact, an asset in securing the homeland. Uh, but oftentimes, we know that sometimes our workforce may not be as familiar with certain communities as others. Uh, uh, we are primarily a nation of immigrants. Uh, and so our aim is to make sure that newer American communities are, feel as, as, as welcomed as those of us who, uh, who trace uh, our heritage back uh, a few years and, or a few decades uh, or a couple of centuries uh, or going further. And so we've developed a number of training tools uh, offered both to the DHS agencies, such as uh, you know, TSA or ICE or CBP or USCIS or others, as well as our, uh, through, uh, through FLETC, the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center, um, uh, to our uh, local uh, and state law enforcement partners. Uh, and those are tools that are always available and I can have a chat offline with anyone who's interested in learning more about that, uh, that approach. <laughs> One thing that we've learned, uh, and this is something I think it's demonstrated well today with the fact that it's the US Department of Justice that invited the US Department of Homeland Security to come in and have this conversation, is providing a whole of government approach. Uh, our aim is to no longer say, this is not in my lane and therefore it's not in my business. Uh, part of the lesson, the painful lesson we learned after 9-11 was we need to have that whole of government approach. Whether we're talking about uh, intelligence or law enforcement efforts or whether we're talking about broadly speaking and having these types of conversations at the local level. Uh, and so having that whole of government approach, making sure that uh, the Justice Department works with the, home, the Department of Homeland Security or that we work with the Treasury Department or the Department of Education uh, or Health and Human Services at the federal level and of course with our colleagues on the ground here locally, uh, our hosts here today and, uh, and, and uh, our partners in uniform in the audience. Um, that's what we mean when we say Homeland Security. It's establishing that glue, that connection that often sometimes uh, we've seen missing in the past. Um, so what does it take to respond to all these challenges? Uh, there's no one answer. If we had the answer, there would not be a need for DHS to invest in these types of conversations. Uh, if there was one answer, we say, okay, well, the feds have it, we've got it covered, then <clears throat> there would not be a need for someone to do community engagement or outreach for the Department of Homeland Security but we don't have the answers. That's why we're coming to you. That's why when local communities, such as uh, the leaders represented here today who asked uh, for our help and support in providing this information, um, that's part of the puzzle. But it's putting together a puzzle. Every aspect of society plays a vital role in making sure our homeland is safe and secure, and that the ideals for which we're fighting for and let's not make any mistake about this. We are fighting for very specific ideals that have always represented our nation. Uh, the only way for that to happen is for all of us as Americans to work together to make sure, number one, our homeland is in fact safe and secure. Number two, to make sure that what our homeland stands for, has always stood for, is also safe and secure. One doesn't go without the other.
You can't have one either way without the other. And that's what we're trying to do at the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. So um, I don't want to go too long. I'm available to engage in a discussion and help answer uh, uh, any questions that uh, people may have. Um, if I don't have the answers, uh, I do have my email address up on the screen. Feel free to, to jot it down and email me and I can follow up. And of course, uh, Mildred is here locally. Uh, she, can, she can definitely serve as your primary point of contact on F anything related to any follow-ups. But again, I want to thank uh, Miami-Dade. I want to thank uh, the, uh, the um, uh, Community Relations Board for inviting me. Uh, for working with the DOJ uh, Community Relations Service and others to make sure we have this important conversation uh, and uh, I'm uh, available for any questions. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Mr. Shore. Um, we've been better informed about uh, what's happening at the federal level and um, want to issue just a few house rules now as we engage in conversation and dialogue with our, with our guest. Um, first, we'll have uh, any questions or concerns uh, proffered by the members of the day, as many of whom are members of our Community Relations Board, and some of them are members of our Asian American um, Advisory Board. So we'll go first, and I would ask you, as I always do, to frame your questions uh, so that they are presented in, uh, in about a minute to give our guests a chance to respond. And in the audience, you get a chance to respond once we finish the dais, and we do have a little time. Um, would ask that you have remarks and or comments uh, for no more than two minutes. This is really for the community. We want you to get engaged, be involved in this conversation, and uh, ask what you will of Mr. Shora, and I'm sure he will, he will answer. So let me start to my right and go around the table again. Uh, if we have enough time, we can probably go around again once the community's had a chance to present their questions and, and concerns. So we'll start with you, Mr. Fulton. Good to see you. Um, you have a question for our guest today? Thank you so much. I'd, I'd like to add my thanks, and it's not a question, just a 30-second um, remark that we, um, at the, in the Jewish community, and I'm representing the Greater Miami Jewish Federation, are very closely involved with DHS. And I want to thank both you and your local people on the ground. They really need to be recognized. We have very close collaborative efforts with your people here, with your agency here. Um, we have uh, yearly briefings, and sometimes twice a year, for Jewish institutions. They are always represented there, always extremely helpful um, and engaged with our community. I had the privilege of being the Miami representative to the Washington, D.C. DHS <coughs> briefing. Um, and so at every level, um, we are involved. In addition to the funding, uh, we're very thankful that the nonprofit security funding was increased to uh, 20 million, um, up from uh, about 14, I guess, last year. We uh, also take uh, full advantage of those funding. So on many levels, um, really across the broad spe spectrum of services, I want to offer you uh, our thanks. Thank you so much. <coughs> um, as well as my colleagues, we want to thank you for your presence. Um, I think uh, Homeland Security has done such a great job, but our concern as a mother is how hard are we actually looking uh, to protecting our schools? Um, I received a message yesterday about if it would be a possibility for the school that my daughter it was, it would be closing. So it's a very concerning um, aspect, at, at least that's right now one of my major concern is sending my child to school and not knowing um, if we are actually doing the right steps and if we can help you as a community activist how exactly um, we can actually give you guys more information or how we <coughs> can engage others to protect and see and report like you say. It's a very um, unfortunately very timely question as we know. Um, and uh, to be honest with you, number one, I hate to defer, but uh, in this case, I, uh, the primary uh, responsibility and mission would be obviously our, our partners in uniform uh, in local law enforcement. Uh, they have a, the toughest job. They're the first responders, and, and they're the ones that can give you the best advice on how you can protect a very specific institution, whether it's academic, school, or otherwise. Um, and so I can't speak at the local level. Um, but from a broader perspective, 
I think having that uh, engagement effort be very regular is, is extremely important. Uh, I mentioned the See Something, Say Something campaign, which is obviously at the federal level being implemented locally uh, in various jurisdictions. Uh, the See Something, Say Something campaign can actually be tailored depending on local areas of concern so that people are aware of what constitutes suspicious behavior. Obviously, all we're talking about is suspicious behavior, not personal characteristics of any kind. Um, but there are ways for people to be on the alert. Uh, you know, we can't uh, be ignorant of the fact that we are, as a society, facing a very specific set of threats, which has impacted our school systems, as we well know, unfortunately. And part of our effort, part of our, our responsibility, is to uh, stand up and speak up and to actually say, what can we do, as you just asked me, but what can be done locally to implement an awareness-raising effort? Uh, when we say, see something, say something, this is a branded campaign that we got from, I think, the, initially from the New York City um, uh, area uh, that we basically uh, had an agreement with and then we were able to uh, dish it out uh, locally to various local jurisdictions. But that's what we mean. That's the aim of see something, say something for DHS is even at the very local level, with a local school, if a parent or two parents or three parents have a very specific set of concerns, you can implement a locally driven awareness raising campaign community wide so that you feel everybody in the community, whether inside that building or outside that building or the neighbors that live around that building, know how to react and what, what, is, what constitutes suspicious behavior related to the current set of circumstances. So here we're talking about a local school. What can be viewed as, wow, this is, I need to call local police, this is not, something's not right. That's your best effort. Um, yes, as, as a part of the, of the PTA, Let, let's come, let's I come. really want to thank you for, oh. for, that, for, that, for that comment so I can engage with the city of Miami, which is where my daughter goes, and they being very, very helpful. Thank you so much. <gasps> Mr. Shura, thank you very much for visiting our community. I hope that uh, you'll come back and visit us uh, more often. Um, election time again. And we do have um, um, quite a bit of uh, presidential candidate um, these days who have taken the opportunity of um, Muslim bashing and uh, perhaps insulting many other minorities in here uh, in order to gain some um, popularity in here. And that has actually caused some um, nervousness and anxiety in some of the uh, communities as well. And um, frankly, um, uh, I'm aware of uh, the Muslim community uh, who are extremely uh, um, concerned uh, with some of the publicity that some of our uh, presidential candidates are getting for uh, Little League. Um, I'm wondering um, if your department um, uh, would be um, uh, has thought or w would be willing to reach out to some of these communities to um, uh, have presence and actually share with them that um, um, while we do have individuals who are uh, Muslim bashing, nevertheless, uh, in this country, um, the law prevails and everyone in this country, uh, you know, has the rights. And um, as uh, you mentioned in your uh, introductory remarks, uh, we are better off when uh, our entire uh, uh, nation is united and, um, you know, we understand and respect uh, each other. Um, uh, there has been an uh, absence and lack of presence by uh, the law enforcement uh, and, um, in, in these communities uh, to really to give them the comfort level that they are, in fact, part of this uh, American dream and uh, American nations. Uh, I'm interested uh, to hear your comments, your thoughts about that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, very, very legitimate question. Well, I can't comment on, on obviously, uh, anything ongoing with the, you know, uh, uh, in the political realm. I, I can tell you that uh, my boss's boss, Homeland Security Secretary Jay Johnson, in fact, uh, a little over a week and a half ago, uh, visited the Al Dulles Area Muslim Society Mosque, which is the largest mosque in the Washington DC metro area, the second largest mosque in our country, um, where he met in a round table, a relatively large round table with interfaith leaders, 
uh, from all different diverse faith-based communities in the DC metro area. And then he held a press conference at the mosque, which was, uh, as I saw, it was actually relatively well covered, where he issued a very strong statement uh, uh, from a DHS perspective, uh, commenting on exactly what you just referenced. Uh, we do see strength in our diversity, uh, and we don't want any aspect of society alienated or uh, disenfranchised, because that is one additional uh, negative that we would face in providing that unified effort to uh, protect our homeland from the different threats we face. Uh, Secretary Johnson was, uh, in fact, unequivocal in his comments, and I'd encourage you to look it up. It is on the uh, DHS website, and as I said, it was well covered uh, by, uh, by the media. Separate from that, and I'm not going to speak on behalf of the Department of Justice, but I can point you to the remarks that were made uh, two days before that by the Attorney General of the United States, very much echoing what uh, Secretary Johnson also said. And I would point you to the remarks that were made by President Obama himself. Uh, when he addressed uh, that, that conversation very recently in public. So uh, as far as at the local level, what are we doing? How are we speaking uh, with this specific faith-based community, the Muslim American community? Um, we actually do that very regularly and all the time. Uh, I'm here in Florida, for example, and we are having an event this evening uh, at one of the uh, local major uh, Muslim community centers. Uh, I'm having a round table tomorrow, and our host happens to be a Muslim American community center up in Tampa. So, uh, and I'm not the only one. This is a, you know, a, a unified effort. It's a team-wide effort. It's a department-wide effort to have, uh, make sure that all communities feel that uh, we are addressing whatever specific grievances or concerns related to violence uh, that, that they may have. Uh, if you can point us to any very specific local level concerns uh, from specific communities, I will gladly follow up for DHS and see what we can do to address those concerns. Okay. Yes, sir. My name is Victor. I'm representing the Asian American Advisory Board and also the Indian American community. And the Asian American community has community members from uh, India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Iran, and all major uh, Asian countries. One of the uh, concerns or one of the areas that I'm looking to get some information is the cyber presence, you know, in schools and in other, um, you know, for the youth and the young, um, the 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 perpetrators are very well versed in in uh, cyber, uh, you know, cyber. So, what are some of the signs, or what specific programs can be implemented at the school level, or where uh, that information is gathered? Um, if if somebody gets on their Facebook that somebody has You're radicalizing them, huh? You're radicalizing them. Say that again. They use that to radicalize. Right. So how can we protect that that it should not happen? Thank you for your question. That's a very timely question that we're we're tackling uh, uh, very head on. Um, we know that violent extremists have capitalized on social media. There's no question about that. It's, it's been well documented. And uh, we offer a tool uh, that is a little more uh, in depth uh, as far as community engagement, where we, uh, it's called the Community Awareness Briefing, or CAB. And the aims of this Community Awareness Briefing that me and others conduct at DHS uh, are to basically educate members of society at the local level how violent extremist organizations uh, or individuals are leveraging social media platforms to prey on uh, vulnerable individuals. Um, and as you referenced, oftentimes it's, it's younger individuals, it's people who are well versed in using different social media platforms. And so our aim is to highlight through very specific real life case examples that have unfortunately happened in our country, how individuals have fallen victim towards that. And the answer is it's really, it's basic parenting. Mm. It's basic parenting. It's a, a lot of it is there's this generational gap uh, as far as the means of communicating. An individual who might be 14, 13, 12 years old may choose to communicate differently than someone who's in their 40s or 50s. 
they do use social media platforms that uh, someone not in that generation may not be familiar with or aware of. And so we've partnered with school systems on the ground, or oftentimes actually local police departments have these resources available, where they come in and basically teach you, parents, what uh, ways are available to prey on kids using social media platforms. And this is not limited to the area of violent extremism. Violent extremists have simply capitalized on it. Uh, we know in the area of where sexual predators go after kids, they tend to leverage the same platforms in trying to, go to, to target uh, minors and kids to go after them. So it's basic parenting. It's knowing, always knowing, what your child is doing on their iPad, uh, laptop, computer, what have you. Always uh, do not take it for granted. And uh, you know, don't think they're too young. Uh, you know, kids in our country are first exposed to social media, which is, as I said, a constructive means of communication that's available to us in, in this modern world. But they're exposed at a very young age, age six. Oftentimes, six-year-olds in school, first grade, kindergarten, start learning about how to use different social media platforms. And so our aim as parents is know who they're talking to on those computers and laptops. Uh, know what kind of videos they're accessing. Uh, know who's trying to befriend them, whether it's Facebook or Snapchat or Instagram or all kinds of, of platforms out there right now. I, uh, I, I myself am ignorant of a lot of those, those platforms, but there are at least 17 to 20, as I understand, major platforms that, that uh, younger generations use these days to communicate, which is fine. But it's your job as a parent to know who they're communicating with and how. Would you want your, your, your 12 or 13 year old to be calling people on the phone not knowing who they're speaking with? It's the same exact concept. Of course not. You need to know who they're talking to. Same but, exact concept. Thank you. But, but that's very difficult because just a small point. They don't let you even come close to their uh, iPad. <laughs> you know, that's, that's like... You bought it. <laughs> you can't. You can't. Let's, do, let's do this. We have uh, at least three members of our board that would like to ask questions, but in fairness to you, let me take a couple of questions from the community now, and then we'll cut off and come back to the panel, because I know a lot of you have taken off from your various jobs and uh, other responsibilities to be here. So if I can get a couple of questions from the audience, uh, come up, introduce yourself. Uh, you have two minutes. We'll give our guests a chance to respond to those, uh, those, uh, those queries that you may have. If not, we'll keep going. Thank you, Director. Not a question, but through the chair, I believe my uh, colleagues behind me have waived their time, so if I may take their two minutes as well, because I don't believe that two minutes is enough for what I wanted to share with uh, the board as well as, as to what's going on here locally when it comes to our homeland security and uh, ensuring that civil rights for all are guaranteed and enforced. So you're going to take two minutes plus two minutes? Is that what you're saying, Director? No, I'll take a, a few, if I may, a little bit more than two minutes just okay. to address some of the things that were said here. Yes, sir. You were, you were in a bad hand again, questions. so I'm not going to argue with you, but sir. But we can, we can count real slow, and, uh, <laughs> and we'll get it done. I will speak fast and quickly. First and foremost, Mr. Shoro, thank you so much for coming to Miami-Dade County. And I know that the audience is not behind me, as you expected, but know that they're watching on television. And this show, will, this uh, t TV program will air repeatedly. Uh, over the next couple of days, so we'll be, you know, there will be plenty of people watching. Um, to begin with, a, a little bit of background on, uh, on our agency, you know, we have about 4,000 employees, uh, 2,800 and change are sworn, uh, the rest are, are uh, civilian. We're a very diverse agency, uh, which mirror the community almost exactly. Because of that diversity, uh, we're also very diverse, not on purpose, but it just happens to be that because when you enter into a diverse workforce, we also have a diverse religious background in our agency, which includes all religions pretty much that I know of. We have from Buddhists to Muslims, Catholics, Christians, you name it, we have them. Um, I share that because our department certainly does not tolerate um, profiling and does not tolerate uh, bias-based policing. 
when it comes to our core values of integrity, respect, service, and fairness, we believe in those core values. Fairness being the most important when we're talking about the topics today, ensuring that all get treated fairly. So when we look at our community and we're, we're discussion that we're having today about tolerance, without tolerance for all, I believe that we do not succeed. And our agency stands behind that. Intolerance creates hate and this, which is what we've seen recently in a couple of uh, locations of, of Muslim locations and Jewish communities of late where there's been um, you know, graffiti and other activities that have occurred, one in Broward, one in Miami Gardens, some in the northeast side of a uh, part of Miami-Dade County. Uh, we investigate some of those and we do a robust investigation every time something like that happens. Our agency does not prepare for any action or any activity related to an active shooter or terrorist attack based on religion, race, creed, you name it. An active shooter is an active shooter, regardless of what their belief is. Once the shooting starts, it's too late. So we address those all the same. So we don't, do not have specific training for someone that is uh, you know, against abortions. And we do not have a specific training for someone who calls himself a Muslim and says there's a jihad in his mind and decides to pick up a gun and harm people. Ill-intended people are ill-intended people and we address them the same. And that is the philosophy of our agency. You talked a little, about, uh, a little bit about training. We train our officers in active shooter, like I just mentioned, active shooters. Uh, all Miami-Dade County police agencies train their officers as well. We also focus on behavioral recognition to address our calls for service or our own identifying suspicious activity so that we can address threats to our, to our community. I am a stakeholder in this community, obviously, but only by position, but because I am married, I have a wife named Christina, and I have two daughters. So it's in my best interest not only to serve this community to the best of my ability, but for my own family. So I take this matter serious. And when I come stand here before you, I speak not only on behalf of the, you know, the, the department and the service of the community, but my own family and for myself that live here. So we take this serious because we all live in this community and we want to keep it safe and secure. And once again, safe and secure, what does that mean? Tolerating others, tolerating differences, and that's what makes this country one of the best countries or the best country. And this makes it, our community probably one of the best communities to live in, in my opinion. When it comes to our homeland security matters, shortly after 2001, our department, like many other agencies, created a homeland security uh, unit. It evolved into a section and shortly became a bureau. Since then, that bureau has been very active with the Federal Bureau of Investigations, with the Department of Homeland Security, not only in active investigations through the Joint Terrorism Task Force, but also through, through uh, slogans and training of community, doing uh, outreach programs, maintaining relationships with various sectors, from religious sectors of the community, to water and sewer, to transit, so that we're entrenched in the airport and the port, so that when ho something happens or prior to, we already have those relationships built so that we can act quickly following Department of Homeland Security's uh, guidelines, and I know the names have morphed over time period, but dating back in the day, back to 2003, 2004, we've been following the guidelines by the federal government on how to address these, and we mirror the federal government in having our sector detectives conducting infrastructure protection uh, uh, surveys and assessments for our community and various buildings. We do all of that. The say something, the see something, say something slogan is something that we've been doing for a quite some time now. And as of recent, we've been pushing it out even more because of the holiday seasons. As you know, holidays is a time of giving and a time of peace and a time of joy and also a time to be prayed upon. So normally we have a Grinch detail, a Grinch operation, Grinch busters to address the uh, crime or the potential for crime at soft targets. This year we added a different component with some tactical units and deployments, which I'm not going to get too much into, not to expose ourselves too much. Um, we talked a little bit about schools and what we do at schools. I can tell you that the schools, Dade County schools, have their own police. 
They do train their staff members on how to uh, react to a threat within the school. They have evacuation plans and they have bunker down plans within their schools. And obviously we're all trained to address the problem as quickly as uh, possible to be able to minimize the number of casualties if something happens in the schools. It's an unfortunate reality, but this is the world we live in. The same applies for all other soft targets. We treat those the same. We try to maintain a healthy dialogue with securities at malls and so forth so that if something happens, the employees there know what to do, how to lock down their stores, where to hide. We recently pushed out by the Department of Homeland Security created some videos, run, hide, and fight. The three, you know, three terms that they use now to describe what to do in an event of an active shooter, we pushed that out through the media. The Miami Herald also caught on to it and put an article on it, and we continue to do so through social media. We talked a little bit about, a little bit about cyber investigations, and you know, there's different types of cyber stuff that goes on with when you involve kids. Cyber bullying, we do cyber bullying training. We have ICAC training, Internet uh, Crimes Against Kids. We're part of that task force to investigate those sexual predators. We also have cyber crime investigations. We also partner up with the FBI to address some of those cyber concerns that you mentioned, sir. So uh, social media, we monitor social media. I'm not gonna get too much into how we monitor the social media, but no, we do monitor social media. We have a fusion center in Miami-Dade Police Department, one of 70 plus fusion centers. If you imagine a spider web, all the fusion centers throughout the country are connected through technologies and also other means. So we communicate very quickly with other sections of the country. So if something happens in California, we try and get real-time information through the Fusion Center, and we also participate in the National Operations Center through our Homeland Security, representing South Florida. So with that, I will yield the remainder of my time to the rest of the speakers. <laughs> Renita. <laughs> Thank you, Director. Thank you. Thank you so much for using your four minutes wisely. Ms. Holmes, you have two minutes. Thank you. Well, I thank you, my partner, them, uh, in advance and mimicking such great leadership. I'd like to ask, just in case I go over 30 seconds, just a little bit more than two minutes, considering the equity and partnership, but I'll do my best. I think I just took 20 and I don't see a clock, so bear with me. Tolerance is so very important it's on every side. There is a vital importance. Um, I'd like to thank you as well. It was very refreshing. And um, subsequently to these fine two gentlemen that made me take that selfie with them um, to just, no, we have a great relation. And I think it's so important to give that value to the relationships, the responsibility, the power of relations on the ground with, between first responders. You know, I don't have a badge and a gun, but I necessarily know the importance of it. And coming from, believe it or not, a family in the background, I understand what happens internally. And I'm hoping that the internal practices of these great concepts that you shared us dwindle down to the overall holistic policing, when we say community policing government, not just policing policemen. Because I know the policemen and women that are here, and I really do know them personally, go far and beyond where politics and authority and administrators can go who make decisions relatively to relate and identify as important in relationships. You can't tolerate what you fear or what you don't know. So I see them a little bit separate and a little bit more intricate. You spoke of terrorism and, and my commissioner for the city, um, Commissioner Keon Hardiman, just upright and, and, and coined it well when he, he noted that um, domestic terrorism is one of the issues we have. It, whether it's local or national, it still reeks and when I see uh, small groups not make it here like the trans the um, trans or LGBT on a national level but here locally we're like a whole different world and when I don't see them participate before me up above me or down below me on a national level they have these great concepts and strategies I see the opportunity for people to create more hate at home and so I like to find out internally how we can get government on every level whether national here to deal with that terrorism and that type of hate with these subculture special cultural groups um, lastly um, diversity without equity is an imbalance but it, it denotes that something is unfair and we talk about the civil rights of those who occupy municipalities where domestic terrorism comes, then we know we need to start targeting it there. It's nice to have you come down. I like to see 
you and the rest of this great board that we have. And we have some great active members because they go from the podium, from the pavement to the podium. I like to see those concepts and those strategies go from the local to the national, not just the national to the local. Um, and lastly, um, one of the persons that I talk about the internal and the healing and local to national and being able to have that cultural reach that the, the best authority who created that term, community, poli community oriented policing. These are our community police officers. But their practice, their concept, and their strategies of outreach, education, information, and relation building to the utmost to keep the screws together, I've seen that practice with Ms. Robles. She's not afraid to let anyone be themselves. But what really hurts me, makes me a lot more intolerant, and concerns me is that when our Department of Justice outreach has to spend a lot of time creating relations between those professionals up there versus those there. And the inequity of thinking of these guys as a first responder during domestic terrorism in local municipalities and neighborhoods like this, we need that type of professionalism and relation building. We need that type of monitoring and we need that type of report. We need these type of meetings because it's hard to talk in two minutes, and it's hard to talk when you got there. Ms. Holmes, can you wrap it up? But Yeah, I'm wrapping it up. I'm, I'm just speaking to the gentleman because he's actually listening to me eye to eye. Can the, you wrap it up? Yes, I'm wrapping it up okay. and listening to me eye to eye. So in that conclusion, relationship building is important. When we have individuals that sit on dioceses and deal with relationships in government but don't know how to have relationships with the people who are being, then it's still just community policing, not community-oriented policing, not the real spiritualism, the healing, and the safety and health of everyone considered. It's not real communications, and it's not real tolerance. I'd like to invite you personally to come to some of the Women's Association meeting. We'll talk about websites, domestic terrorism. We'll see that relationship practice. We'll sit with them, and we'll have that conversation. And we'll sit in equitable positions, not y'all up there and us down here. Because bullets don't know the difference. Unsafetyness doesn't know the difference. And that's the real healthy practice of community-oriented policing. Not y'all and us, but all of us thank, together. Thank you, Ms. Holmes. God thank bless you, you, and thank you so much. Have a safe trip back, and happy holidays to each thank and every you, one of you. Ma'am, I, I promised that I would have two speakers from the audience and then go back to the podium. So I must may, remain true to my, to my remarks. So hopefully we have time. We definitely have to be out of here by a quarter of. We have another meeting that begins at 2. Our speaker will be here uh, hopefully afterwards to engage perhaps one-on-one -on -one with some of, you, uh, some of the audience. But for right now, let me finish the podium and we'll come back. Uh, Ms. Mildred Robles is gonna yield her time and uh, our vice chair for law enforcement and criminal justice is gonna yield her time. That takes it down to Mr. Shohat. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and, and thank you again, Mr. Shohat, for coming. We, I, everybody appreciates that, I'm sure you know. Uh, I want to follow up on uh, on a remark that uh, Mr. Kashravi made and that, that you alluded to in response to his remarks. Uh, we are seeing um, severe Muslim bashing in the political arena today. And you, in response, made the remark you can't comment on the political arena. I am wondering whether or not DHS, and particularly your uh, department, your sub-department of DHS, the Community Engagement Section, has any uh, involvement at all in perhaps communicating to the campaigns of some of the candidates that it is counterproductive to the objectives of the Department of Homeland Security and our government to engage in, uh, in political campaign tactics that perhaps are not calculated because they don't think of it this way. They're calculated to get votes, but that are, appear to be calculated or have the result of exacerbating the problems that we have. I think it has been widely reported that some of the attacks we've seen around the country on, for example, mosques and similar institutions seem to be directly correlated with some of the bashing that is going on by certain political candidates. Uh, does DHS think about or have 
programs where they can get in touch with some of these campaigns and encourage them at least if they're going to say that we're not going to admit Muslims until we get a handle on the problem, that they also should say that this is not intended in any way to create any animosity against the Muslim community. The statements don't seem to be balanced, and at least we could have balanced statements. Thank you. Uh, th thank you for your question. Um, I, I really do have to reiterate my, my position. I'm limited in my ability to be able to, to give the response you're looking, you're, you're looking for in your question. Uh, the, it, DHS is primarily a law enforcement agency, <clears throat> and I'm a civil servant. My job is to make sure that I do not engage uh, in any uh, political conversation, uh, period. Uh, with that said, uh, I do want to, again, reiterate what uh, my leadership has done uh, Secretary Jay Johnson has issued quite a number of statements uh, in uh, uh, making sure to echo what the President of the United States has indicated, uh, that uh, the strength of our nation is grounded in the fact that we are uh, a diverse society and that the fact that our diversity uh, gives us that edge in securing our homeland. Uh, my leadership, Secretary Johnson, uh, as I said, less than a week and a half ago, uh, a week ago Monday, uh, physically visited our nation's second largest mosque uh, and met with the community for about 45 minutes and then had a press conference uh, that was very well covered with a very diverse set of faith-based uh, leaders from the Washington, D.C. area, both at the local level and the national level. And his remarks, which are available on the DHS website, and as I said, they have been quoted uh, in the media, uh, are unequivocal in the position that uh, we get our strength uh, in protecting the homeland based on the unity of effort and based on the diversity of that unity of effort. Thank I you. Pre I appreciate your response, but can I have one follow-up question? Is there any way that the campaigns can be visited? I'm not talking about political comments or make, taking political positions. I'm talking about educating campaigns and campaign staffs on the best way to conduct a dialogue in this very, very sensitive environment that we're in. Again, that goes beyond the, the mission of, of the Department of Homeland Security. We, we have to remember that we, we do have a U.S. Constitution, and uh, our First Amendment, I think, speaks to what we can and cannot do. Thank you. Thank you both. Ms. York? Um, I was going to say that some cities have more violence than others, and it just basically is guns are too easily available, and nobody ever says that. Nobody ever says, you live in America, it's your right, you can walk around the neighborhood with a gun, and uh, nobody really addresses that's the basic thing and the basic problem, because a gun is not a toy. You own a gun, somebody's going to get hurt. Thank you, Ms. York. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I will make it short. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. It's good to see you again, sir. Thank you for your service, and thank you for joining us here today. Uh, my uh, great concern is uh, that you addressed, and I don't expect an answer from you, really, uh, being that, you know, as you speak on the, on the broader spectrum of things, uh, but, you know, when our men in blue who choose to serve and protect our communities are the ones that have to put their life on the line to go and answer a call such as a terrorist situation as it happened in San Bernardino, California, uh, that's a very, very scary situation. And our communities throughout the country are very scared and are very scared of uh, our porous uh, borders that uh, people continue to come from all over the world, uh, from all over Latin America and elsewhere that we don't know where they're coming from because the Iranians have a base in uh, Venezuela and everybody else is, you know, all over uh, the world now. This is not something that is isolated. And we are a country at war, whether we like it or not, since 911. And we didn't choose to enter that war but we were put into that position, and we are in very dangerous times. So to me, you know, I think that we are not ready to address a, a vetting of uh, a people that come across the border in mass, and, uh, and uh, to leave it up to our local uh, law enforcement 
uh, you know, to or to those who choose to see and uh, and observe and uh, communicate uh, the risks that may be happening in their community. That is very dangerous. I don't want to see another 14 people lose their lives, those who lose their families. I don't want to see uh, the parents being killed or the children at a school being shot to death. That is, you know, we have too much of that as it is to for us to risk any farther situations. To me, sincerely, and my own opinion as a citizen, uh, to say that we're going to, uh, you know, receive thousands of people, whether they're from Cuba or whether they are from Syria or wherever they come from, that we cannot properly identify who's coming into the country, that's a negligent uh, purpose. And I think that doesn't serve the, uh, the interest of the community or the risk that we will be facing. Uh, at the same time, uh, I think that uh, uh, we have to be aware that law enforcement and uh, Homeland Security and so on cannot address, and the FBI, of course, here present also, uh, you know, that uh, uh, they cannot address every risk and every situation that we may be encountering in the near future. So we have to be tolerant, and all, all of us have to participate in securing our situation. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Mr. Thank Chair. Thank you, Mr. Valdez. Okay, we have, a, we have a chance now. We have five minutes to conclude this time together. So if you'd like to speak, I'm going to ask you to come now to the podium so we'll know exactly how many speakers we have left. Uh, I don't think we have time for more than the two <coughs> at the podium. And again, our guests will probably be around for a few minutes after, uh, after we're concluded. Many of us have to go to another meeting that begins shortly. Um, so again, the rules are your comment and or uh, question can take no longer than two minutes. And to, to the fact that both of you are here, I'm going to ask that you do it in one minute if you can. Hi, my name is Berlinda Faye Dixon. I'm a proud Muslim American. And um, I am, my question is for the undocumented. I am a retired nurse and case manager with Smash the Slumlords. And primarily the population that I end up dealing with is the population in slum and blight apartments, which happen to be a lot of times undocumented, whether they be Hispanic undocumented, okay, uh, from a Latino uh, background, or they're from a Muslim background, okay. Um, right now, I'm dealing with a huge Muslim male population that is undocumented, that works here in Miami, and they're very scared. I know we saw a shooting down south Florida City somewhere where the store owner was shot. He happened to be Muslim, okay? This is, now, that wasn't blasted out like, oh, it was a target hate crime, but as a Muslim, knowing in my community that it probably might have been, my concern, this is, this is going to be on television, okay, and people will see it. And for all the people that are in hiding, that are Muslims, that are working, it's a little bit different when, for the most part, the undocumented Muslims that I know about free, have happen to work in small, smaller stores. Ma'am, what's your question? Because my we, question I want to be is, fair. Yes, I'm getting to that thing. Okay. My question is, is that there have been targeting strategies within our communities that I've seen, whether or not they were actually planned that way by different departments, but. Um, we have a problem there, and I'd like to know, and I'd like for you to explain to the Muslim community that is undocumented, what is Homeland's take on that, and how are they handling that as to not profile uh, and target the Muslims that are here from other countries, and what is Homeland doing to protect them? Yes, we have, we have issues that have Ma'am, you, you gave him a question. Thank you. Thank you so much. Feel free to respond, sir. Thank you. Thank you for your question. I, I think I understand what, what you, you wanted to follow up on as far as um, uh, the concern you're, you're, you're facing in a, in, a, in a population here that you referenced that seems to be uh, feel very vulnerable at this time. Uh, number one, and as I mentioned and as my, uh, my, my friends in local law enforcement said, violence is violence. And uh, regardless of the motivation behind that violence, when someone chooses to cross that line of criminality and take action and target an individual, regardless of motivation, uh, 
the responsibility is to report that act of violence. Now, I understand that you're, you're referencing individuals who may feel that they are vulnerable uh, as a result of their immigration status in the U.S. or lack of documentation. Reporting. I'm sorry? Lack of reporting. Lack of reporting. I understand that. And this is something that we have tackled across the country, not specific to one population, but the concern that uh, individuals may not report acts of violence uh, as a result of their uh, immigration status. And while I cannot speak for uh, my partners in local law enforcement as far as how they choose to carry about doing their business, uh, the Department of Homeland Security through Immigration and Customs Enforcement um, has a very specific set of standards, of priorities, of how we choose to go about uh, enforcing our nation's immigration laws. When it comes to our Office of uh, Enforcement and Removal Operations within ICE, they operate by that standard, a very specific set of, of standards that they prioritize on. Uh, I can assure you, and, and you can speak, and I'll put you in touch with my colleagues at ICRO here in the Miami Dade area, Dade area uh, and they can tell you the same exact thing, is they will operate by the uh, DHS uh, enforcement standards that uh, are uh, currently uh, uh, in impl implementation. And so when someone reports that they're a victim of an act of violence, uh, based on those, if, if that's the only thing, that's the only information that's available to, uh, at, at the time, uh, and the person is not uh, themselves found to be in violation of other, uh, 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 other laws, criminal laws that are very specifically enumerated, then I would uh, tell you that the ICE ERO individuals who's responsible for enforcing immigration law will tell you, please report the act of violence. We don't want crimes to go unreported because communities feel that they're going to be vulnerable towards immigration enforcement. <coughs> I hope that answers your question. I can't go into more specifics because I don't know the specifics of individual cases and I cannot comment on individual cases. But generally speaking, uh, the, the enforcement standards are very clear. There's a three-tier system that DHS, specifically through ICE, operates by. And uh, our advice is to always report on uh, any act of violence that takes place. Thank you, Mr. Shora. Sir, you have the floor. You happen to be the last speaker for the day. Thank you for your time. First and foremost, uh, I'm Sergeant Richard Hernandez with Miami-Dade Police Department. I'm a uh, supervisor at, within the Homeland Security Bureau of Miami-Dade Police Department. Um, along the vein of the last question, we encourage the community, regardless of documentation or lack of documentation, to report crimes. We respond as a law enforcement agency to deal with crimes and citizen concerns. We don't ask those questions. It's not our role. It's not our job to deal with immigration issues. We deal with crime specifically. So with regard to the young lady's question, we encourage the community to report it regardless of the situation. Um, in furtherance of promoting the See Something, Say Something campaign, I wanted to take a second uh, to mention the number to the community where they can report suspicious activity. In South Florida, it's 1-855-FLA-SAFE, 1-855-FLA-SAFE. Uh, that translates to 1-855-352-7233, and that's all I have, sir. Thank you for your time. You're a good closer. Thank you very much. Please help me. I know you can't applaud from the chambers, but uh, let's smile at least and be appreciative to, uh, to our guests who are coming all the way from uh, Washington, D.C. to help us understand better the role of Homeland Security and his role. And we are very indebted to Mr. Shore for taking time out of his very convoluted and busy schedule to be with us today. We're indebted also to Mildred Robles for uh, helping facilitate this meeting for the members of the uh, Miami-Dade County Community Relations Board and to our partners uh, who work with the Asian American uh, Affairs Board. Thank you so much for being here. And we hope that all of you, uh, if you have time, will stick around and at least shake hands with and welcome to Miami our very special guest, Mr. Kareem Shora. Uh, with that said, this meeting is now adjourned.